my name is Penny and I'm with Nature's Calling. Nature's Calling is an environmentally based program that reaches out to schools, scout groups, um, private events, as well as working very closely with wonderful city of Suffolk. I do tours uh, with the Suffolk Visitor Center to the Great Dismal Swamp. The Great Dismal Swamp is very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, the Great Dismal Swamp is a treasure that we have in our own backyard. And this National Wildlife Refuge encompasses approximately 112,000 acres. Historically, it encompassed over a million acres of land. And I'll show you this map. Right here are the um, borders of the Dismal Swamp as seen today. Right here to the north, we have US 58. Down here to the eastern part, we have US 17. Over to the western part, we have Desert Road. And then down here is the refuge office. If you have an opportunity to go out to the Great Dismal Swamp and enjoy it, I would highly recommend stopping at the office. Um, the office is open Monday through Friday. Uh, they have wonderful staff there, and that wonderful staff does allow me to take tour groups out to the refuge. Um, and the Great Dismal Swamp at one point again encompassed over a million acres. Today, due to farming and due to logging industry, that refuge has been cut down quite a bit. Now, prior to it being a National Wildlife Refuge, it was just a very vast open swampland. Um, in the 1700s and up into the 1800s, a lot of that swampland was cut down for farming practices. When they did want to farm the swamp, they realized that the tannin or the acidity of the soil was not conducive to growing crops. So at that point, they realized, hey, we've got trees in here. Well, the trees that they would harvest would be your Atlantic white cedar as well as your bald cypress. And these trees that were harvested were harvested for the sole purpose of building shingles for homes. If you happen to be driving through the city of Suffolk or some of the other towns available, you would see the sides of the houses look like they have wood paneling on them. Those are your shingles. The Great Dismal Swamp, prior to being a Great Dismal Swamp, the property was owned by the Union Camp Logging Company. The Union Camp Logging Company turned that land over to the Nature Conservancy and they turned over 35,000 acres. The Nature Conservancy then turned that land over to the Department of Interior and in 1974, Gerald Ford signed off on it, making it a National Wildlife Refuge. It is one of the largest National Wildlife Refuges in the Northeast, and it is also one of the largest natural laboratories found in the world. Think about 112,000 acres. One third of the refuge is in Suffolk, one third is in Chesapeake, and down here, one third is found in North Carolina. At the very, very southeast corner, that is the Dismal Swamp State Park that is owned by the state of North Carolina. Right here in the middle, you see Lake Drummond. Lake Drummond is one of two natural lakes found in the state of Virginia. The other one is going to be Mountain Lake, and that is out towards the Roanoke area. Lake Drummond is approximately 4.2 by 3.8 miles in um, length and width. Lake Drummond was um, formed about 3,000 years ago, give or take, and a couple of ways they think that the lake was formed. Number one, um, a firebird coming down. The indigenous tribes from that area believe that a firebird came down and created the lake. A second one would have been a meteor coming down and creating the lake. Well, the Great Dismal Swamp is comprised of peat. Now, this is not your sphagnum peat moss that you're going to go out and find out in your garden center, but it is hundreds and hundreds of years of leaves and branches just falling off of the trees and eventually just piling up. This peat can range anywhere from a couple of inches deep to as much as 12 feet deep. Well, approximately 3,000 years ago when Lake Drummond was formed, what happened was there was probably a peat fire. And if you've lived in Suffolk long enough, you have seen two peat fires in this area, one in 2008 and one in 2011. Well, this peat fire at Lake Drummond burned and it created the lake. It burned all the way down. The lake does have a sandy bottom. And the reason for that, about 16,000 years ago, this was 
where the Atlantic Ocean came. Um, the Atlantic Ocean has since receded, and we have over here what's known as the Nensimon Scarp. Now, that's an escarpment where the land and the ocean once met. If you have an opportunity to drive from the city of Suffolk into um, the Great Dismal Swamp, you will notice that you're going to go downhill a little bit. And that is what the scarp is causing, is causing it to go downhill. Well, with that scarp, we also have underground waterways or aquifers. These underground waterways would allow water to come into the Great Dismal Swamp and percolate up. Well, that's what made it a swamp. When um, they came out, when these men and women first came out, excuse me, just the men, um, came out and wanted to farm this land and then eventually start logging it, they couldn't do so with as much swampy water as they had. So they decided, let's dig these ditches. Well, there's about 150 miles of ditch work dug throughout southeast Virginia. And of that ditch work, 90% of it was dug with slave labor. Now, Jericho Ditch was dug with slave labor, and right here is Jericho Ditch. And Jericho Ditch was dug for the sole purpose of transporting the, these um, shingles that these men made out of the Dismal Swamp up into the Suffolk area and then eventually into the Norfolk area for trade. Um, we also have Washington Ditch. Washington Ditch, how did that get its name? Well, from George Washington. George Washington once stood on this land. He did utilize this area. There was a small town there known as Dismal Town. That was George Washington's base camp while well, he was surveying that area and eventually logging that area. Right here is Railroad Ditch. Railroad Ditch got its name for that very reason. When they were hauling timbers out, they would use narrow gauge railroads. There is a retention pond right in this area that they would use to um, for the steam engines. They would haul those timbers out of there and eventually, again, into the city of Suffolk. Back then, a smaller town. Um, Railroad Ditch is now open to the public. You can go down Railroad Ditch Monday through Saturday until April 1st. As of April 1st, Railroad Ditch going all the way to West Ditch and Interior Ditch is going to be open Sunday through Saturday from 7 to 7. Um, there is no fee to get there. They also allow boating in Lake Drummond. Prior to January, or excuse me, April 1st, you needed a permit. You will not need a permit any longer. You can kayak, canoe, and you can also take small uh, motorized boats, no more than 25 horsepower. A Lake Drummond, at its deepest point, is approximately seven feet deep. At its shallowest, it averages about four foot deep. So you could feasibly walk across it. I highly recommend against doing that. Um, if you decide to boat out there, please pay attention to the weather. When you go out to Lake Drummond, she can be a sheet of glass. Other days you can go out there and it's going to look like you're at the ocean front. That wind kicks up and it starts churning up white caps. However, when you go to Lake Drummond or when you go to any waterways in the Dismal Swamp, you're going to notice that they are not clear like our water that we drink now, but they're very, very dark. And the reason for that is the tannin or the tannic acid that is released from the leaves into that water and that causes that brown coloration. So when you're out at Lake Drummond and you see brown caps as opposed to white caps, the water is fresh water. It is not, there is no salinity in that water. Um, at one point, Lake Drummond was utilized as a drinking water source. Now our water definitely comes from uh, Lake Gaston, which again is out towards the western part of the state. This area here is a feeder ditch. If you choose to launch a canoe or kayak or a boat off of the Suffolk side, you would come in through railroad, west ditch, and then interior ditch. You can also launch from a spot on the Chesapeake side. Chesapeake side is going to be right off of Balahack Road on 17 and come in through the feeder ditch. I will let you know it's going to be about a nine mile paddle both directions. Um, but it is a very nice paddle. You will have to pull your boat out of the water as there is a lock in that area. If you choose to come out for a guided tour, you can contact myself personally. You can contact the 
uh, Suffolk Visitor Center. They are wonderful people. I'd we'll be more than happy to book a trip for you. And some of the things that I talk about on that is just the natural world that's found out at the Dismal Swamp. We have a number of different species out there. Uh, some of those species would of course include snakes. Um, we have three venomous snakes found in this part of Virginia and of those three venomous snakes they are all found in the Dismal Swamp. That would include your cottonmouth, your cambrake rattlesnake, and your copperhead. Now the copperhead and the cottonmouth are cousins. Uh, the cottonmouth is one of four venom or four aquatic species found in the waters throughout the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, now the copperhead is going to be our most prevalent species of venomous snake and I'll show you a skin of copperhead. This would be your copperhead skin. If you'll notice there is no black on this whatsoever. It will also have that X pattern on it. Um, and the came, or excuse me, the cotton mouth as a juvenile will also have that pattern on it. Copperhead does get its name because of the copper color of the skull or the head itself. Now, the copperhead and the cotton mouth again are cousins. Uh, copperhead is one snake that you're going to find a lot underneath things. Whenever you're walking, you want to make sure that you are very careful about where you're stepping. Now, the third venomous uh, snake that we have out there is going to be your canebrake rattlesnake. Now, the canebrake rattlesnake is an endangered species. Very few of them are around, and the reason for this is, number one, if we fear something, we as humans are more likely to try to eradicate it also with habitat destruction. Um, so the Great Dismal Swamp is the one place that the canebrake rattlesnake can find refuge, and it is highly protected out there. But with any wildlife on the Great Dismal Swamp, all of it is protected, as well as the plant life that is found out there. Now, we talk about venomous snakes, and of course, some people do fear them. And this right here, is the skull of the copperhead. And you'll notice that it has little fangs. Now, if you wear jeans and tall boots, the chance of these fangs are not gonna puncture you. But again, one thing you wanna do is make sure you watch where you step. If you come across the snake in the wild, the best thing to do is to take two steps backwards, turn around and walk away. Snakes do not wanna waste their venom on something they cannot eat. Once you take those two steps, turn around and walk away, you are out of striking distance. A snake is only going to strike half its body length. Okay. All right. Some of the other wildlife that's found out there, we have an abundance of turtles. Uh, we have our snapping turtles. Well, snapping turtles are going to be the largest turtles that we have out there. And this is a snapping turtle skull. It is an aquatic uh, turtle, and if you look right here, this is where the nose is. Now, with aquatic turtles, they have to put their head above water, and they'll keep their bodies below water, and that actually helps against predators trying to attack them. Well, with the snapping turtle, they don't so much have to worry about it. This right here is called the beak, and you think about a snapping turtle. That would hurt. So as a full-size snapping turtle, they do not have predators. The only predator that they would have is man, and that would be us. Out there we have painted turtles, and then another turtle that we would find is going to be your spotted turtle. Spotted turtles are adorable. They look like they have little ET faces. They're about that big, and they're black with orange dots on them. Again, that is a protected species. They are only found in waters rich in tannin. Um, it is against the law to keep those as pets or to try to harvest them for any other reasons. Um, again, please protect all the wildlife that is found out at the Dismal Swamp. Now, some of the larger animals that we have out there, we have 700 pounds of fur, and that would be your um, black bear. Now, black bear, when you think about it, when we go out there, I do talk quite a bit, so they're hearing me, they know that I'm there, and they're not likely to attack. If you happen to come across a black bear out at the Great Dismal Swamp, 
we're typically on a bus, so we don't have to worry so much. And we've seen them a few times. It's always a pleasure to see them. Um, but the thing is, if you come across the black bear, raise your hands above your head, make as much noise as possible, and that tends to scare them off. The only time it would least likely scare them off is if you were in between a sow and her cub. And that would be with any mother and her young, and she is going to stay and protect it. We also have beaver out there. A beaver do their share of logging as well. A beaver do not eat the entire wood. What a beaver is going to do is it's going to eat the bark and the cambium layer that's right underneath the bark. That is where all the nutrition is. Now when you think about what a beaver eats, this is beaver scat. And all that is is sawdust. So if you happen to come across scat or what's known as poop and it looks like sawdust that's your beaver um the animals do have to share the refuge with others and that would be humans now prior to us settling suffolk and settling chesapeake the great dismal swamp was home to two indigenous nations well after the indigenous nations and after people coming into America and starting to settle it and make it their own, we had unfortunately slavery that was taking place in the area. Well, as these men were coming in and they, they were working and they decided, you know what, I do not want to be here. I, I need to escape. I need to escape from my life. I need to escape from my family. And they did escape. And it was not easy. It was very, very difficult. And one of the places that the Underground Railroad did come through was the Great Dismal Swamp. Now, the Underground Railroad was not written down. It is not an actual railroad. What it is, is there were signs on people's houses. There were marks on trees that would allow these men to know in which direction they needed to travel. Now, at one point in the Great Dismal Swamp, it was just the men there. And these men would stay there for 5, 10, upwards of 50, 15 years until they were capable of finding passage from Norfolk into the northern states. Now, with that being said, once you got into the northern states, that did not always mean you were going to be free. Now, in the Great Dismal Swamp, you think about how are you going to survive out there? I've been out there when it's been 110 heat index. I've been out there when it was 32 degrees. It would not be easy to survive out there, but it would be easier to survive out in the Dismal Swamp than it is to be getting beaten by a slave owner. Now, when these men came through there, they would be able to go back and walking through there you can put yourself back in time and think about the foliage and think about the vines that were out there it'd be very difficult to see somebody 30 and 40 feet back because those branches and those vines would break up a silhouette well slave owners decided they were going to have slave hunters go and look for the slaves because the slave owner is not going to go into the swamp um, so they would get these slave hunters these slave hunters would bring in dogs. Well, the dogs are not going to care about a silhouette because of their noses. So what would happen is those dogs would be able to follow these men into the swamp. They would be able to find them. So in the Great Dismal Swamp, and we'll look at the map again, there are areas where it is going to be just peat. That is going to be where you're going to find your bald cypress, uh, your cedar trees. Um, your different vines, then there are other spots where you're going to find your pine trees. Now, pine trees in a swamp, that is going to sit on higher, drier ground. That's called a hammock. Now, pine trees do not like their feet wet. So when you see a pine tree in the dismal swamp, you know that you are on higher ground. Well, these men that went out there also realized this. And what they would do is that would be their home. Now, these hammocks would be surrounded by water. It would be like an island. Well, there is evidence that there were cabins being built out there. Now, it's not the type of cabins that we see on HGTV. It was basically just a platform, a roof, and some walls to protect them from outside um, sources from the weather from the animals whatever the case may be but these men survived out there not only was it just the men and at first it was but eventually the women came in 
Well, after that, they did have children. These men and women reared families out there. Now, with these maroon villages, and these escaped slaves were known as maroons, with these maroon villages, what would happen is they still needed to provide for their families. Sure, you could hunt. There's an abundance of deer out there. There are bear. There are turkey. You can fi find fish out of the swamp. Um, but they still needed to buy other things. So what these men would do is they would build shingles. These shingles are about yay long, so you're looking at about 18 inches. Um, again, built with bald cypress or Atlantic white cedar. Um, and they would build those inside their maroon villages and then sneak out of the maroon village, go into town, sell them, and then purchase what they needed to bring back into their village. Now, when they came back, it can be just as treacherous as when they leave because just because you were a person of color does not mean that you were going to be allowed back into that village or back into that village. Reason for that was there were still people of color that would be more than happy to sell somebody else out for either their freedom or for money. And so there were signs that they would have or different knocks or whatever the case may be in order to get back into their village. Not only would they make shingles, but turpentine was another thing that they would, again, use as trade. Now, eventually, um, these men and women, again, made home out there, but eventually, thankfully, slavery did end. Um, I have been very fortunate to speak to quite a few people who are descendants of slaves. Um, there's also a professor from American University, his name is Dr. Sayers, and Dr. Sayers has wrote a book and has done extens extensive research and um, digs in the Dismal Swamp, and his book, and I highly recommend this read, is A Desolate Place for a Defiant People. Um, and Dr. Sayers does go into depth about some of the things that he's found, but just the whole natural history of the swamp and how that plays in to how these men and women were able to survive out there. Um, Dr. Sayers does have a few dig sites. I am not privy to those dig sites and um, they are a kept secret and the reason for this is they are afraid of looting. They do not want looting to take place. Um, they are cataloging these artifacts, and some of the artifacts that they have found, they have found fine china, and they have also found a clay pipe. Now, that just lets you know the demographics of people that were out there. The fine china, I would imagine, would have come from the Washington group. And then, of course, the clay pipe or the old pottery would have come from the maroon villages. Um, they have found dump sites. Now, these trash sites are by no means as large as the trash sites that we have nowadays, but just very small trash sites. Um, but they have been finding quite a few artifacts out there. I am encouraging that and I am hoping to one day get to see and take pictures of some of these artifacts. Uh, it is something that is very near and dear to us as humans um, and as people, and especially those who grew up and call Suffolk home, this is part of your history as well. Now, being a transplant and being new to Virginia per se, I moved here in 2001 and my background is in wildlife. I am a naturalist, but coming out here and learning about the human history, learning about what has taken place out here has really just piqued my interest and I am trying to read as much and talk to as many people as I can just to get more information. All right, well I'm hoping that I will get to see some of you out on one of the tours. Again, um, please come out and enjoy the Great Dismal Swamp. They do a tremendous amount with the general public and on April 21st through the 23rd is the birding festival. I will be assisting in walking tours and we also have bus tours out there. Um, book early, I do believe that they're kind of booked up right now, but um, come on out and take a gander. There's going to be a lot of people. Whether you are interested in bird watching or whether you are a professional bird watcher, 
even if you've never done it before, come out. There are plenty of people to talk to and lots of neat things to learn. Also, if you want to come on one of the guided tours through the city of Suffolk, we have a number of dates that we will be taking bus tours out, and we're also starting up kayak tours. If you cannot get on one of their tours, by all means, contact me personally, and we'll get you set up on one of your own private tours. Thank you very much for your time, and have a wonderful day, and get outside and explore.